I can't contract. Chairman Robinson? Here. Dr. Hollander? Here. Mrs. Hill? 
Here. Mrs. Jones. Here. Mrs. Lennon. Here. Mr. McClendon. Here. Mr. Smith. Here. Mrs. Sermon. Here. Mr. Harris. Superintendent Dr. Johnson. Here. Item D, New East Hamilton Middle School County Project. I have a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. Any reports? Dr. Hollander? Yes. Mrs. Hill? Yes. Mrs. Jones? Yes. Mrs. Lynn? Yes. Mr. McClendon? Yes. Mrs. Robinson? Yes. yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mrs. Sermon? Yes. Chairman Wingate? Yes. Next, we'll have our pledge to the flag and our meditation. Uh, Dr. Shane Harwood from Signal Mountain Middle High School. Thank you for the opportunity to participate tonight. Uh, if you will, please stand with me and join in doing the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> you may be seated. <laughs> Dr. Johnson, Chairman Wingate, ladies and gentlemen of the board, guests, uh, for this evening's meditation, I wanted to share some thoughts about something that's been on my mind lately, uh, being an educator, and that's dreams, uh, and kind of our role as parents and educators in making sure that our kids have an opportunity not only to dream, but have an opportunity to reach those dreams. Uh, we have some, some special things happening in, in our district. We have Future Ready Institutes. We have some great work happening in the Opportunity Zone, uh, and we're doing a lot of things in education to try to help kids to achieve those dreams, but I think all of us can, can play a part in that. Some would say that one or more, one of the more important roles as parents and even as educators that we have is to help our kids to dream, to help them have aspirations, to set goals, and to teach them to work hard to achieve their dreams. In today's world and even in our district, we know that our kids come from various home lives, they encounter different circumstances, and they have various degrees of support. Although we may, now ha may have no direct control over some of those things, I think we all can do our part and encourage others to help our kids to dream. As we reflect on that thought, here are a few things for us to not only talk about, but also to model when we're around kids. Dreams, thoughts that we can all have freely that can inspire and affect us in ways we cannot imagine. Dreams, feelings that come to us sometimes through inspiration, but also through what we hear, what we see, what we do, and what we're exposed to or have the opportunities to experience. Dreams, positivity that can drive us to work harder, be better, and do more than we ever thought we could. Dreams, hope that we can keep, that can keep us going even when we feel like giving up. Dreams, Understanding that dreams can become our reality as hard work and preparation lines up with opportunities that were provided. And then finally, dreams, confidence that we can do amazing things. So as we work together this evening on behalf of our kids, and probably even more importantly, as we go back to our families, to our neighborhoods, to our schools, my hope is that we can not only uphold our roles in helping our kids to dream, but to also inspire others around them to do the same. And here's the thing, folks. When we do this, watch out, because it gets pretty special. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harwood. Next, we want to recognize some exemplars of excellence, uh, Mr. Keith Fogelman and Ms. Angela Askins. Good evening, Dr. Johnson, Chairman Wingate, and members of the board. It is with great pleasure that I stand before you tonight to recognize nine exemplars of, e of excellence within Hamilton County Schools. From December 13th through, I'm sorry, from August 13th, 13th through December 19th, our substitute teachers had the opportunity to work 82 days in our district. Out of approximately 700 substitutes in Hamilton County Schools, we had nine substitute teachers that worked all 82 days. So it is with great pleasure tonight that I introduce to you these substitute teachers. So I had already directed them, when I come to the podium, follow me. <laughs> I don't think they wanted to do that. 
<laughs> so it is with great pleasure. We had six of our substitute teachers that were able to attend tonight. Three already had prior commitments and were not able to attend. So at this time, I would like to recognize these substitute teachers. And Chairman Wingate, you will be presenting them with a certificate. Okay, so once I call their name, um, just walk on around to Chairman Wingate. He'll present you with a certificate, and then you can shake the board's hands. Our first recipient is Miss Natasha Hyder. <laughs> Sam Daywood. <laughs> Tamara Gant. <laughs> Linda Scrippa. Cedric Dozer. And Tracy Fears. We had nine subs, I'm sorry, three substitutes that were not able to attend tonight. That was Robert Palmer, Mitchell Perry, and Clarence C. Chairman Wingate, if I may have a privilege, I have got a really fine group of young people and some leaders here, uh, Troop 82 from Harrison United Methodist, and I had the privilege about a year ago of speaking with them about how government officials work, and I've known some of them since they were little guys, and their parents and, and sponsors are just wonderful, and if you would please, Troop 82, would you stand up, please, and the leaders. Let's give these folks a hand. Thank you, guys. They are learning about government, and uh, they, they want, I invited them to come, and I'm very thankful they were able to make it. And so they want to see how our government works. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, guys, for being here. I, I want to say quickly before we move on um, to, to you folks that have um, served in the role of substitute teaching and, and shown up every day, uh, if you've ever been in this room and you've been a substitute teacher, um, you know that it can be really tough and um, you've got to uh, love what you're doing and uh, it's really special when you've got subs that show up at the same schools uh, every day, day after day because then they begin to build relationships with kids and that makes all the difference. So thank you guys for what you do. All right, next we will move on to our delegations. Ms. Jeanette Omar Kale. I know you know the drill. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you for your interest in addressing the Hamilton County Board of Education. During your presentation, please address the board as a whole, not individual board members or administrators. Also, do not present complaints or concerns you have about an individual employee of the school system. If you wish to voice those complaints or concerns, you should contact the central office and ask for a meeting with the <coughs> superintendent. If you are criticizing an individual employee, I will interrupt you and ask you to refrain. If you continue to criticize individual employees or if your remarks are an error, error or are becoming repetitive, I may interrupt you and ask you to sit down. Please li limit your remarks to five minutes. I will tell you when you have one minute left. You may begin. Thank you. Good evening, Chairman Wingate, board members, and Dr. Johnson. 2019 has already begun with a whirlwind of activities, as you know, and looks to be a very energetic year. The current memorandum of understanding is ending in July, and the teachers voted to start the process to renew. We have begun our meetings, and I, for one, am excited about the process. We are getting input from our teachers so everyone has a voice. We are beginning our, our meetings, our teams are working, and I believe we will have many areas of complete agreement and a few discussions. Um, and I believe, but I believe the areas of discussions will give all a sense of satisfaction in the end results. You will also see a lot of red in the year as educators look at the legislative issues coming to the State House. 
To build support for public education, educators across the state will be wearing red for ed on Wednesdays and other challenge days. TEA and HCEA are focused on our 2020 vision challenge to raise education funding to the Southeast average by the year 2020. The General Assembly has increased funding by $1.5 billion over the past seven years, but Tennessee is still behind neighboring states on investment per student, with many needs still unmet. We believe that we can get to the regional average if the state increases funding by a historic but reachable sum of $800 million. We believe this can be done without raising taxes or cutting important government services. We know that this will take an organized movement of educators, parents, and concerned community members. Some facts to consider in this, Tennessee schools get more out of every tax dollar than any state in the South and more than most states in the nation. Tennessee ranks 39th in investment per student, yet is ninth in on-time graduations, the highest in the region. And only three states have better graduation rates for African-American students. Our state ranks sixth in average ACT scores of the 20 states that require all students to take the test. Of those states, Tennessee ranks 14th in funding per student and is $1,235 under the funding average. 64% of Tennessee's high school graduates are now entering college. Hamilton County is positioning itself to be the fastest improving district in the state. TEA's 2020 vision campaign is in line with that goal. This fits with HCDE's proposed legislative agenda. Imagine what we could do with more investment in our schools. Our 2020 vision campaign also focuses on testing and stopping high stakes decisions based on standardized testing. Assessments are valuable and critically important part of education. We heard two teachers share last month how they use the data from TenReady. Testing needs to be put in its proper place. Using the data as a means to improve instruction, diagnose, teach students rather than as a label that punishes or sanctions. The TenReady test has had issues from the start. To use it to place a value on our students, our teachers, our schools, and our districts is just wrong. This year, the state will begin to use the test scores to label schools with a value of A through F. Who wants to raise their hand that they attend an F school? Labeling our students and our communities as failures undermines their morale. In addition, communities' economies are negatively impacted because it's difficult to find investors or homeowners who want to purchase property in an area with a school that's labeled as a C, D, or F. These high stakes decisions have far reaching effects beyond the classroom. This test and punish system is also why TEA has had to fight each year for hold harmless legislation when testing failures and irregularities have made testing penalties not only unfair, but possibly career ending. We believe it is time to change state law on testing. Put it back where it's used to improve instruction and assess students. Members of the board tonight, I ask you to support Hamilton County students and educators, support 2020 vision by wearing red on Wednesdays, and let's work together to ensure that every student has the opportunity to attend a great public school. Do you have any questions? Okay, thank you for your time. Next, we will have a Future Ready 2023 monthly update. Mr. Fogelman. Good evening, uh, Chairman Wingate, Dr. Johnson, members of the board. Uh, we're going to. Uh, of course, fastest improving district, that's a focus. That's a focus for our department as we move forward. But uh, tonight I'm gonna talk a, a little bit about great teachers and great leaders. Um, and so when we look at our metrics for this uh, uh, particular uh, strategic area, I'm gonna focus on uh, three of the metrics, time to offer, diversity index, and our retention rates. Uh, to give you just a little preview of uh, what we uh, expect to see or hope to see by the end of the year. Uh, 
trends, uh, teacher retention. We looked at our first semester, um, beginning of the school to the end of the first semester just to see what our resignations looked like compared to the previous three years. We had 31 resignations compared to a three-year average of 46. So, you know, we'll continue to monitor that, but we see that as a positive trend. Time to offer. Uh, you can see our, our uh, chart there, our goals for the future, uh, but we're target for this year is 32 days. We're early in the hiring season, I recognize, but our so far, year to date, our metric has been 21 days average to fill a position or to make an offer for a position. Uh, diversity. Um, so this is a comparison from last year to this year, and uh, essentially, we had no movement, uh, no increase, no decrease, uh, but uh, our goal is to increase. Uh, and what we, some of the actions that we're taking is uh, we're adding uh, seven historical uh, black college and universities to our recruiting schedule this year. We're also expanding our outreach to um, uh, experienced teachers. Some of the ways that we're doing that is uh, through uh, uh, our expanded social media. We're looking at, uh, you know, we review our applications on a daily basis. One day this week, Tuesday, when I looked at it, we had uh, teachers from seven different states that had applied for positions. So we continue to work on our outreach to experienced teachers. Tonight, as I go through great leaders and great teachers, I'll primarily focus on recruit and retain, but uh, also we'll touch on some of the other aspects of this, uh, this strategic area. Uh, as part of that, I'd like to give you a TNTP update. You know, we had the new teacher project come uh, in, began last summer and finished up in November. They went through a process of looking at our current technology, our processes. They looked at the things that we were doing well and also our opportunities for improvement. Uh, they gave us some recommendations and they looked specifically at those six areas on, your, on the right hand side of the slide. Their findings uh, dealt with four specific areas. First of all, uh, we need to have an increased focus on the customer experience. Uh, the second one, we need to engage local and regional partnerships to be able to broaden our recruiting reach. Uh, we need to align our technology with our talent strategy to remove any process barriers that might exist, and we need to empower our school leaders as cultivators of talent. Now, I'm gonna step through these at a very high level uh, to just kind of give you a feel for some of the uh, recommendations we've received. Uh, customer experience. Uh, this, this first bullet maybe sums it all up, that our formal customer experience strategy is really a core function uh, of HR and uh, it's, an, it's an opportunity for us to improve. We think it addresses or that we, as part of our uh, initial strategy that we started out last year, we were looking at recruit to hire and have a consistent process, processes and consistent interaction for candidates through that entire process. Uh, but uh, it also identified option, opportunities for us to improve our interactions with our customers, not just our applicants, but also our employees. Uh, some of the interactions that we have opportunities to, uh, to engage in to in improve would be our technology, how our technology interacts with our ap applicants, uh, process clarity. Uh, being sure they know our, our applicants and our employees know who they need to talk to, who's the point of contact for them. Being sure that more than one person can answer the questions so that we don't have a single point of contact for any specific area and that we have a focused for being solutions minded as we uh, are interacting with our applicants and our customers. Partnerships. Uh, 
we need to um, establish a talent task force. And part of that talent task force is, you know, we're already working with a lot of um, our university partners, community partners, but really what the focus would be is to formalize that uh, relationship, formalize that partnership with the university, with businesses, with our community organizations. Technology, uh, embark upon a formal vendor analysis for a new applicant tracking system. Uh, you know, we're using a, a product called SearchSoft, and we currently uh, are looking for ways that we can optimize that system, things we can do to augment, but there's, all, there's a point in, uh, that we're only gonna get so far with that current system. Uh, a good example is it's not capable of a uh, applicant being able to submit an application via this, via this uh, mobile device. Matter of fact, Dr. Highlander had some experience with it last week uh, and uh, can probably tell a story or two about how, uh, how it didn't work so well for him. So that's uh, something that we wanna look at going forward. We think it will enhance our relationship with our applicants and also provide uh, a more efficient process for especially our administrators as they're going through the hiring process. Uh, TNT did just a quick analysis of a couple of four systems. They did looked at SearchSoft. You can see it in the green highlight there. It's the first system, uh, and it's not so. Uh, as you look at that, I, I think the key is is to really look at the legend on the on the left, and it identifies weaknesses neutral attributes of the system or strengths of a system. So these four systems are used by other school districts throughout the nation. And as you can see, the system we're currently using has a lot of weakness and we think there's opportunity for us to improve that. Uh, empower school leaders. Uh, when we looked at that one, our focus really went to uh, more early hiring. We think that's an opportunity for us. Early, early, early is really one of our uh, key focus areas this year. Uh, and the reason it is, when you look at early hiring, this is last year's data, 53% of our hires occurred after May 1st. If you look at what uh, well, good performing school districts, they'll be in the 65 to 75% range before uh, May 1st. So uh, our staffing timeline for this year, uh, just to point about some of the things, again, it is, uh, a, our focus is early. Uh, you know, pool postings, we started in November with pool posting for math and science positions. Uh, our fall recruitment event was about three weeks earlier than the year before. Uh, opportunity zone postings, a month and a half early. Uh, our other learning community postings almost a month earlier, not quite a month. Uh, our fall, our, excuse me, our spring recruiting event, uh, we're gonna be about a month early there. And then we're looking at last day for internal transfers. We're about two months earlier there. So we should be able to identify issues earlier on and be able to make uh, uh, earlier hires, make earlier hires. Uh, I just want to point out that we also select, posted and selected a pool of APs, assistant principals, and we've completed that. And so we will have a pool ready to go as openings uh, uh, develop this spring. It also gives us some insight about where potential teacher vacancies may result as a result of selections. Uh, we've also, as a result of that, started, uh, uh, as we notified both the selectees and the non-selectees, we provided them a survey so that they could give us feedback on development opportunities that they felt like they needed and also some of the experiences that they feel like uh, would be valuable to them as they try to uh, uh, advance their career. So I'm going to move into looking at just four, three key areas, recruiting, uh, technology, and uh, recruiting technology and retention. 
So I'll just hit on some of the areas here. Uh, customer service, we're working on a customer service plan. Uh, we benchmarked, uh, went and visited EPB and Blue Cross and Blue Shield, looked at the plans that they have, uh, their approach to customer service, and we brought that back and started to formulate a, a, a plan that we'll be rolling out to our senior leadership team. We're looking at, I mentioned earlier, our con early contracts already, pool postings. Uh, we've uh, developed uh, pool postings for some of our hard to fill positions. We already have those up so that we can uh, select people in that pool and we'll have ready candidates for our principals as we, as we have vacancies develop. Preview days, our first one is tomorrow. Uh, we've got nine candidates coming to tour Opportunity Zone schools. They'll be looking at uh, visiting uh, elementary and secondary schools. They'll have lunch at Howard, and we'll be able to do interviews, and possibly coming out of those interviews, we may have some early offers. We uh, expand in our social, social media reach, uh, looking at uh, not only and, uh, Hamilton County Schools accounts, but we also have Opportunity Zone accounts so that we can actually focus and target uh, candidates specifically. Uh, teacher, uh, Tennessee Human Capital Network Group. We've got a, a team of, uh, of uh, Dr. Highlander, Penny, myself, Jill Landtroop, Angie Cass, that is working with a state or the state. Um, it's a, a working group. About 20 other districts are involved in it. That we're looking at some of our uh, opportunities for improvement, and we're, the ultimate goal is to number one learn from the other districts, but number two is come out of that with a formal strategy. Moving forward, uh, I see a, HCS candidate experience, that's really just kind of taking our preview days and really uh, uh, upping our game there. We've got some future plans there that we'll you'll see in the future. Uh, we're looking at the potential. Is it, could we do a teacher referral plan, program rather? Uh, we're exploring opportunities for relocation support uh, uh, and looking at what other districts are doing and seeing what we can bring back and implement here in our own district. I'll mention the alternative substitute teacher staffing. One of the things that we know we need to do is improve our rate of feel. And we're looking at either two options. Number one, uh, we potentially could do some reorganize, reorganizing our approach in-house, or we've also started to explore some vendor solutions that uh, we think could be cost neutral. And the feedback that we're getting from other districts is that's a, 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 a uh, that the service that they're seeing has been uh, has been more than satisfactory. Uh, just to give you a feel of our recruiting with universities, and. Uh, uh, and we're really taking a more of a regional focus. We've got 36 universities that we're interacting with. That's up from 15 from last year. Technology. Talked a little bit about this already, but we're in the stages of previewing some applicant tracking systems in case we have an opportunity to be able to replace our current. But one of the things we're also doing is looking to streamline information um, so that what we really want to be able to do is transition our workforce from having data entry to be able to interact and interface with our customers, more customer FaceTime. Uh, search off to the cloud. Uh, um, the reason we're interested in that is, number one, it provides us some additional functionality, but it also gives it a new look, a more modern look that we think will be more appealing to applicants as, as they have an opportunity to participate in our application process. We revised the application. Uh, we're starting to see that uh, that's paying off. We're starting to get more people uh, that are completing on the first pass more, more pieces of the application. Uh, and we move moving all of our out evaluations to an online uh, approach. We've had our teachers and our administrators on an online uh, platform, and then we'll have all of our other employees, chiefs, directors, classified employees, all with an online uh, performance evaluation. Moving forward, uh, 
new applicant tracking system is really the number one priority as we move forward here. And we would like to be ultimately able to supplement that with some customer uh, or candidate cultivation technology. I have dashboards there, and I want to just touch quickly on dashboards that we're using to kind of manage the day-to-day -day staffing. Uh, it helps us, uh, the, the red, green, and yellow on the left, on the right-hand side of that first table is just uh, the green typically is we're under 32 days. Uh, so it lets us know once it moves past 32, it goes into yellow, and once it moves into 60, past 60, day 61, it moves into red. What we use this for is it gives us an indication of where we may have potential issues that we need to be working on. Um, as an example, this, you know, we may have a red position and it may be a sourcing problem. So we can identify that and, and go uh, change our approach um, and really maybe refocus some of our efforts around sourcing. What that does though, it allows us really to do some analysis to be able to identify where we may have some specific specific problems. We'll be able to do this by learning community and even be able to drill down into sco particular school level uh, 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 analysis. Retention. New teacher network. Um, it's we're, we're currently we did new uh, we've briefed you I think twice already about what we're doing with New Teacher Academy, um, and at, coming out of New Teacher Academy, then we moved into monthly professional development. And recently, we've started providing dinner. We've been very fortunate to have uh, members of our community, uh, businesses in our community, be able to uh, contribute and donate uh, meals. And it's made a big difference in that because not only are they coming for the PD, but it gives them a time to kind of relax and network with, uh, with their fellow new teachers. We also provide daily support from mentors and new teacher coaches. When we look at retention strategies, one of the things that we're in process of doing is identifying our new, uh, excuse me, our irreplaceable, our hard to replace teachers. And, and the next step is once we know who those are, we're going to go tell them, you know, you're really valuable to our organization. We make sure you know that and we want you to stick with us. Uh, that'll be followed up with stay interviews because we want to understand what keeps people uh, at their job. Why are they interested in staying at Hamilton County? Uh, and of course, we're, we, we're utilizing our online exit interview, uh, taking that information and, and uh, uh, utilizing it to help us uh, develop programs make tweaks to the things that we're already doing. We want moving forward, we want to expand the, the, the new teacher uh, work that we're doing. Uh, we feel like we need to go ahead and start looking at year two and three. That was in our original plan that we would, this would be a three year program for new teachers. Uh, and we're also revamping our, we learned some lessons from our mentor uh, uh, approach. We talk to some other school districts and feel like that we uh, have an opportunity to improve that effort. We're looking at uh, starting to explore employee wellness and on-site clinics, very similar to, to the approaches the county and the city take. Other school districts are doing this and we've got good feedback about cost savings and cost avoidance that we've been able to see, or that they've been able to see. Uh, classified employee development, um, that's an area that uh, we feel like that that's been a, uh, that needs some attention. Uh, we, uh, number one, preparing our ed assistants as they enter the classroom, but also an opportunity to use ed assistants as, a, as one of our teacher pipelines. Uh, and we've got some, uh, been already had discussions with UTC about uh, being able to uh, help us through some sort of educational approach with them. Uh, and then uh, customer service culture. I've talked a little bit about that. New teacher network. Um, what we, what Aaron and her team have um, worked on is planning the PD to kind of match what the first year teacher is experiencing. So what we're trying to do is address and help them ID the realities of that first year. And you can see um, uh, the oh, on the left some of the uh, activities that we've, uh, or some of the PD that we provided for them. 
uh, we've gotten good feedback, good publicity around our new teachers. There you can see Brent Page and Jill Landtroop. Uh, they're first year teacher coaches in the Opportunity Zone, and Jill, uh, Jill um, uh, Aaron Kirby, uh, are in the middle of our new teacher, uh, new teacher uh, induction specialist. And these are kind of the point people for the work that we're doing, but there's a whole lot of people in the background that support the work that they're doing, um, you know, teaching and learning, uh, our HR staff, and um, uh, Opportunity Zone. So there's there's a lot of other folks that are involved, but these are the people who are making it happen every day. Really appreciate all the support. Any questions? Keith, can I ask you a question, please? First, make an observation, because I get a lot of calls about lots of different things. A couple of things that people, you know, seem to be dissatisfied with in, in applying for a job at Hamilton County is they don't ever get calls back. Even when the position is already filled, they're just kind of hanging out there waiting to know. We need to let these people know whether they're getting a job or whether they're not getting a job. Because sometimes they're just kind of hanging on, waiting, and they don't want to take another job until they hear back from Hamilton County. And sometimes we just leave these people hanging until they have to end up calling back, which they don't want to have to do, but they do that. I think there should be a way that we can contact these people and let them know if the positions have been filled or not, and so that we don't leave them hanging. And also about the substitute teachers, I know quite a few people who have applied for the substitute teachers. I mean, and these are not. I mean, these are just your regular, common, ordinary. Some of them are retired. Some of them are just uh, moms, you know, that want to substitute teach, and they never hear anything back. And then some of them, uh, when they have called about it, they say, well, your application had expired. Well, who knows when an application expires? I, I don't know what that means. Uh, do they expire after so many months or... Uh, or what does that mean? I think we just need to be a little bit more clear about that. I think you might get a lot more substitute teachers if we were, uh, like I said, I do know, and some people even in my own family who have just wanted to go back and substitute teach, they said, Rhonda, this is crazy. They keep advertising they need substitute teachers, and we keep applying, and we don't ever hear anything back. Okay. So uh, just those those are the so two of the uh, co complaints that I've had. I think it should be easy fixes. Okay. Appreciate the feedback. Mr. Allen. Uh, Keith, thank you. You, I have enjoyed being with you and look forward on the 28th, or willing to be able to go again to the human capital. Do you think our new policy that we're trying to work on for, um, um, for maintaining discipline will help retrain some of these young teachers who will get a firm discipline policy in place? It's just your, your opinion. Uh, so, a little more than opinion. Uh, looking at exit interview um, information, while it's not the number one issue, uh, it is an issue that gets mentioned. I mean, we, we asked for that specific question about uh, um, uh, uh, behavior, and so we do get some feedback on that. So, uh, yes, I think it probably will help us. Thank you. Ms. Lane. Um, I want to thank you. I think um, how you have identified ways to improve is remarkable, and I think that it, I can see us moving forward as a district with identifying these ways, um, especially with the customer experience strategy. I really like that. So thank you all for all the work that you're doing. It looks well, great. I, I appreciate that, but I'd like to just, uh, there's a group of folks sitting right here that well, are thank you all. very key to, uh, to the success or, or the improvement that we're making. Well done. Um, I certainly echo what Ms. Lennon said. I'm very excited about this plan. I was curious, um, you have a list of some kind of like incentives or like ways to, to attract more talent, like um, relocation packages, I'm trying to find the page. Um, my question is, um, have, you, have you noticed like how competitive your your list of new focus areas on the re, on the recruitment side are compared to other school districts. Like, I think that you, what you're putting together is very competitive, and I'm just curious, like, how does that stack with other districts? 
Uh, so um, from a, uh, some of the uh, signing bonuses that we're currently doing, uh, you know, we're, we're reasonably competitive with, with at, in those areas. Uh, but there's uh, other school districts that we're, as we're starting to, our uh, human capital network we're uh, involved with, as well as just uh, um, the work we're doing just to try to identify what other school districts are doing, are telling us that we have some opportunities uh, in relocation assistance uh, and some of that's supported through the community that we have the teacher referral program is another example of things that we have an opportunity to improve on so while I think we're um, uh, we're starting to uh, I guess we've made some progress but we still think there's more progress to be made yeah, and I was just thinking about how, you know, we're constantly hearing, you know, Hamilton County is not competitive when it comes to teacher recruitment. But I think that, like, we're now, like, stacking up ways where we can say, actually, um, that's incorrect, and here's how we're doing it. Um, so I think that's really great to hear because I get that comment made to me all the time. So it's helpful. Well, one of the things we want to try to do is also sell uh, our total rewards package. Um, you know, we, we uh, got some opportunities in the area of compensation, and I'm sure we'll be talking more about that. But the other, what we also do, we have a pretty, pretty decent total rewards package. So that's another area that we try to sell the total rewards, not just salary. Miss Hill. Keith, I was surprised to see just how low the percentage of our um, teachers are Hispanic and Latino, and wondered. On page 11, you mentioned. The partnerships build new recruitment narratives in collaboration with local minor minority serving institutions. Can you elaborate on that, please? So the the recommendation from TNTP was is that there are um, you know, uh, minority serving institutions throughout the city and that we need to engage more closely with them than we currently, especially from an HR and recruiting, and that they really need to be, we need to pull all of those groups together into a task force uh, and leverage their ideas, leverage some of the thoughts they may have. Um, we also need to, you know, would include some of the businesses in town that are really trying trying to tackle the same issues we are from uh, uh, recruiting diverse employees. Thank you, Mr. Fogelman. Thank you. All right, next we need to approve the minutes from our December meeting. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Okay, Ms. Ford. Dr. Highlander? Yes. Mrs. Hill? Yes. Mrs. Jones? Yes. Mrs. Lennon? Yes. Mr. McClendon? Yes. Mrs. Robinson? Mr. Smith? Yes. Mrs. Thurman? Yes. Chairman Wingate? Yes. Mrs. Robinson? Yes. All right, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Move to approve. Second. All right, do we have any items that we'd like to pull? Uh, Stage lights on. Go ahead, uh, Dr. Highland. I'd like to pull uh, Roman numeral 10 A1 uh, recommendation to Knox County contract on procurement cards. Yeah. Dr. Highland, we're not there yet. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's right. That's right. That's right. Anything under item 9? Okay, I would Ms. like Thurman. to pull item 9 C2 conferences, 9 C5 A. Uh, Federal Programs School Level Improvement Grant and 9C6, um, the General Budget Mid-Year True Up Amendment. Okay, any other items? All right, Ms. Ford. Dr. Highlander? Yes. Mrs. Hill? Yes. Mrs. Jones? Yes. Mrs. Lennon? Yes. Mr. McClendon? Yes. Mrs. Robinson? Yes. <coughs> Mr. Smith? Yes. Mrs. Thurman? Yes. Chairman Wingate? Yes. Mrs. Thurman? Okay. I'm sorry. The first one is about the conferences, this solution tree. Um, 
I guess I just don't understand anything about this. Um, I don't exactly I don't understand exactly what they're going to do. It says it's a powerful professional learning community process uh, that it could cost a amount not to exceed one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Just exactly, are we paying for a process? Uh, what exactly are we buying with this? It says some of the money is for is going to be used from state grants, school-based Title I federal budgets, general purpose funding, self-funded grants, school district donations. Uh, what is this group, and, and why do we need them? So let me start with the uh, uh, explaining around the estimate as well. But Solution Tree provides um, professional development around professional learning uh, communities, um, and they are one of the premier providers of that. And so what we're doing is that each individual school, of course, gets to decide what kind of professional development they want to undertake. And due to our procurement rules, whenever we get to a certain dollar amount, over 25000 in aggregate, we bring it to the board. Um, our uh, amount not to exceed we estimate it based on um, assuming that every school would send two to three people um, if they might decide to do so. We don't know that they would decide to do so, but we decided to go ahead and ask uh, so that we anticipate that they might um, undertake that professional development. So this request is uh, asking for schools to be able to um, opt into the solution tree professional development around professional learning communities, which is uh, one of the key strategies that we have in the district. And I think Dr. Robertson can add to that. There's more specific questions about what we're using it for, but it's a high leverage strategy that aligns with our focus as a district. And as uh, we get more into professional learning communities, more schools are utilizing Solution Tree as a uh, group that provides the professional development. And uh, I, I would just, I just want to uh, mark a point that it's not uh, a one-time 150,000, it's because the number, once it gets over the 25,000. I mean, is this a group that's going to tell us what, so what, for example, there was what a develops professional development we need. Are they the professional development? Are they just uh, exactly? I don't. I'm not understanding so for, why for we need another professional development. If we, I mean, if the schools are going to, like you say, hire their own and do their own professional development at each school, they do that themselves. What do these people do? Yeah. For example, there was a conference in Atlanta that um, several schools sent participants to, not the whole school, but might send one or two people. That total was under 25, but as more people are accessing. Okay, different. when those people went to that deve right. professional development, was it for science? Was it for math? Was it for no, to show you how to pick a new yeah. so it's professional a, a development profession person? What? Sure. So a professional learning community is where we get groups of teachers. So if you think about a fourth grade team, it's trying to develop how that team works together to plan, to look at student data, to make instructional decisions moving forward. So uh, at that level, it might look at, like a team. At a high school level, you might talk about some Algebra One teachers. If you've got four Algebra One teachers at Saudi Daisy High School, working with those teachers to plan, to look at student data, to make instructional decisions. So a lot of time who's going at the middle school level, for example, a lot of our coaches have gone to these conferences. So they can then come back and work with the teachers in their building to make sure that their planning is purposeful, that it's meaningful, and that it's intentional. Okay, well, let me ask you this. What do the people in the central office do? I mean, I thought that was one of your jobs. I thought that's yeah. why we so, hire you to help to make uh, these uh, dis help these teachers and these uh, groups of teachers in high schools and elementary schools to let them understand what they need. I guess I'm just not understanding why we have to continually hire consultants and, and send off to conferences to do things that I feel like should be handled at the central office. I mean, there's a lot of you guys around and we pay y'all a lot of money. I mean, I'm not trying to be a smart aleck, but uh, what, what exactly are you doing as far as helping the people in the schoolhouse if you're not trying to tell them what they I, should I, I be doing? I hear what you're saying, and, and we've got over 3,000 teachers in the district. And, our teaching and we always and, have had. And our teaching and learning staff at Central Office is less than 15 people. 
I, I just said, Ms. Thurman, that this isn't, uh, th these are schools deciding to do this with their with their funds, so they get an allocation, and we try to empower principals uh, to make sound decisions that are aligned to the strategic direction of the district. And so uh, we, we, from the central office, so to speak, having dictated this as a training that they have to, they have some choice and voice. And I mean, candidly speaking, I'm thrilled that uh, that several of our schools are undertaking uh, this as a as a thought. We haven't uh, really. Uh, are they doing it because they're not getting what they need from the central office? I, I, I think you'd have to ask them that. I, I think we provide, uh, we try to provide uh, quality support to them uh, as as much as we possibly can. But it, it's an enhancement. I guarantee you, the people this, the, the, that are doing this right here are not any more qualified than a whole lot of people we have in the Hamilton County school system. You know. I'm not saying that you're making anyone do anything, but I sure would like to think that here in Hamilton County, we have enough people to do this sort of thing without having to load up our teachers and send them different places for people that we don't know to teach them whatever. I thought we, we had plenty of people here to teach strategies and to I, teach. I thought that's what we were paying you for. I mean, I'm sorry if there's just 15 of you, but well, it's not. It's but not it's, I mean, I think there's a whole lot more than 15. I could probably get I, a flow chart and figure that out. Right. Well, he's talking about the teaching and learning side. Uh, one thing I'll just share just philosophically, I think that you learn, you know, you learn, you really learn. Uh, yeah, yeah, we have a lot of capacity inside our district. Uh, we have a lot of talented teachers that we uh, regularly bring around the table to help us make decisions. But you also learn from uh, vicarious experience and from uh, deferring to expertise. And, you know, I think within any field, you always try to uh, look at where the absolute, we want to benchmark against the best and we want to learn from the best. And and I think as 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 much uh, talent as we have, it can also be to our detriment to uh, to just think we can operate uh, inside our district. Uh, it's important when you look at the most successful uh, programs and school districts and and teams and you know organizations, they they learn from others. And so I, again, this isn't a central office initiative. Uh, it's a uh, it's schools and schools have chosen to go to all types of things, and we want to empower them to make those types of decisions so I just want to say <clears throat> excuse me um, I think this is a great opportunity and I know for me professionally um, we always have to do CEUs we're always doing continuing education we're always I mean on my evaluation I remember one year um, I got dinged honestly because I didn't go anywhere or take any type of extra training or additional training um, now I'm in a new position and it seems like that's all I'm doing is, is traveling and doing training to enhance myself not that my boss and my team can't teach me or in, um, provide me with the skills that I need from what they know. But it's always you try to learn best practices, and best practices come from a conglomerate of people. You don't always learn that from right in-house. Sometimes you have to learn that from what they're doing in Atlanta or what they're doing in Chicago or what they might be doing in McMahon County. It's just you're trying to figure out what's the best practice to utilize to bring back. And then a lot of it is teach the teacher, I mean, train the trainer, um, philosophies and so once they go they're able to come back and share that with their peers and their colleagues and other people in the district and it just kind of enhances and expands so I get that it looks like a lot of money but I think overall the payout probably is going to be very beneficial because what they learn there they're able to come back and bring to, to their teams maybe algebra one teams across I'm, I'm just throwing it out but maybe algebra one teams across the district not just at their school but they could maybe share that with everybody else in the, in the county so I think um, oftentimes we have to look at professional development as a means of growth and not just wanting to keep everything right here in house. Uh, Dr. Robertson, quickly, could you just tell me about the um, about the flexibility um, for schools, kind of within this? So, obviously, uh, Solution Trees uh, provides professional development. I'm, I'm assuming they provide that in uh, a variety of different uh, areas. So, schools. Well, and also, is there a limit per school as far as a dollar amount? So I know that you're saying amount not to exceed. You, you don't know who all would take advantage of that uh, or not. But is there a cutoff or is there a certain amount of money that's been allocated you know, to each school? We'd have to look at each individual school budget. I mean, some of this, again, is coming from their their um, block grant. Some of it's coming from Title One funds. So we would have to look at it. in terms of why they're choosing Solution Tree. 
It's because they're a nationally recognized organization that provides really strong professional development in the PLC. It wasn't anyone at central office that said, go to Solution Tree. That's just a, a, a good choice for them. Um, we could pull you know, each school budget, I'm sure, through finance and see how much they've allocated for it. Um, but again, when you're talking about 70 plus schools and you're looking at professional development, it's pretty it's going to go over $25,000 pretty quickly. Yeah. So how would you handle that? Uh, I guess what I'm saying is so they're choosing. They're choosing sure. the, the sessions or the develop, professional development that they'd like to take part in. So what happens, and let's just say, you know, 60 schools go, yeah, we want, we want to do this. Uh, I mean, that 150 is going to go pretty quick. So, I mean, how do you decide who gets to do what? And, and I think that uh, Dr. Edwards was saying that it's the 150 is um, looking at if every school sent two or three, that would cover it. So mm -hmm. the 150 is a pretty high estimate. I don't okay. think that every school is going to send two or three, but when we've got six months left in the fiscal year and we're already over or getting close to $25,000, mm -hmm. that just gives us some some room to grow into. Dr. Holland. And, and I just want to be for clarity, the $150,000 is for a, a whole academic year for all 79 schools. Correct. Does that include the coaches as well Correct. that work out of central office? Okay. It could. I mean, it, as a district, it's looking at as a district, district conference. We would go over $25,000 okay. with Solution Tree. So that requires us to get board approval. What we're saying is that for district personnel, for school personnel, it's not going to go over 150. And if you saw a certain need, I, I think, leaning to what Ms. Thurman said, if you if you in leadership saw a certain need that you felt like we were lacking in or we could be enhanced in, then you might recommend that some people would go to those things. Hopefully. Sure. But, okay. Thank you. Ms. Hill. Um, I th would encourage the board to take a look at the Ron Clark Academy document that's the next item on the agenda. It seems to me it's very similar to this question about Learning Tree, that here is uh, the principal at Eastridge High School who wants to take a group of educators to an event um, in Atlanta, and it's a continuing education event. It's just as, to me, it's just as simple as that. We are a learning organization that should be con really committed to lifelong learning. I know that's what I want every student in Hamilton County to be, and I'm thankful that our teachers and our principals want to be that. Also, uh, Keith, you said that behavior is one of the things that people mention as a reason why they leave our district. Um, I know that statewide, TSBA says that teachers leave the profession because they're not listened to because they don't feel valued. And I can say that when we encourage our employees at my company to participate in events like this, they come back very energized, they feel valued, they feel a part of the organization and they're ready to make change and push us forward and live our mission. And so um, I think this is a no-brainer. Do I have a motion to approve? Move to approve. A second. Dr. Highlander? Yes. Mrs. Hill? Yes. Mrs. Jones? Yes. Mrs. Lennon? Yes. Mr. McClendon? Yes. Mrs. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mrs. Thurman? No. Chairman Wingate? Yes. All right, uh, Mrs. Thurman. Okay, second one is. I'm sorry, the school uh, level improvement grant. Um, Notice here these assistant principal retention bonuses. The one for the Howard School is $30,000 retention bonus. Uh, I just want to know exactly what this person has to do to earn this $30,000. How long do they have to stay? Um, I mean, that's a lot of money, plus the others that are... Uh, on here as well. I think there's one for ten thousand dollars. Two, two more for ten thousand dollars. My computer just went dark here, um, and I just wonder. That that seems like a, a hefty retention bonus to me. Is that for one year? Is that for Ms. Thurman? Will you uh, just quickly, for my benefit, will you tell me which document that is under? Uh, um, it's five uh, A. Do you know? Yes, is it, it school? It is uh, nine C. Yeah, five A. Priority Schools Grant. Okay, the Priority Schools Grant. Yes. I got you. 
Yeah, just, just as a point of re reference, these grants were competitive grants that um, we received three of them. I think there were maybe 12 awarded in the state. We received three a couple of months ago, and you all approved that those grant applications um, at an earlier meeting. So these were in that, but there are three assistant principals at Howard, so I believe that the retention is um, actually 10 per assistant principal. Um, and we did work with HR on signing bonuses and recruitment and retention bonuses to develop criteria for those so that they're fair and, um, you know, allocated appropriately. So uh, we, I don't have that document with me, but we worked with um, Keith and Penny Murray to develop criteria around those. Okay, well, when it said 30, it says assistant principal, it doesn't say principals, it says assistant principal retention bonus, it doesn't say bonuses, so it looked like it was for oh. one person. Oh, good question. Yep. And uh, that seems awful hefty to me, so I just mm -hmm. want some clarification. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, Rhonda, if we were giving that out, I was going back to assistant principalship. Well, you know, I only know what you give you're me. Interested. This is your document you give me. This is all I know. Mr. McClendon. Is that a, a one-year retention? Well, this is a um, grant that should be a three-year grant, but this is year one. If, we're, if we satisfactorily complete year one, then we're eligible for another two years of funding. So it's $10,000 each year they come back? If we if the grant is okay, continued the, by the okay. state, but for this year it's correct. ten thousand. Yes, year. that's correct. Ms. Thurman. Oh. Okay, no. All right, do we have a motion to approve? Move to approve. Second. I'm sorry, who? Okay. Dr. Highlander. Yes. Mrs. Hill. Yes. Mrs. Jones. Yes. Mrs. Lennon. Yes. Mr. McClendon. Yes. Mrs. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mrs. Thurman? Yes. Chairman Wingate? Yes. Okay, Mrs. Thurman? Okay, the next one is, uh, let's see, the general purpose mid-year true-up amendment. On this one, these 11 positions on here, have we approved these 11 positions prior? These positions are part of this budget amendment, so they were specifically listed at the end. So they were listed at the end for us to approve. They weren't approved before. They were so by us right. approving this, we're approving these positions, and we, you know, I don't know that we've ever done this before. Maybe we have, and I just didn't catch it. We do all kinds of uh, creative things. Uh, I thought that we were supposed to approve all new positions. And, and at the end of this document, it's on page 103, you have to go all the way to the end to see all of them. Um, uh, I just I just don't think this is the way that this is uh, meant to be done, that you go, uh, that you have to go through 103 pages to see the 11 things. And, and there was not a there was not salaries listed next to them or anything. They were just listed. And you have to go back in the body, I guess, of the other 102 pages to find it. Well, I started doing that, and I realized uh, this was uh, ridiculous. I don't know why it was given to us this way. We don't know what the salaries for any of these 11 positions are unless you go back and have to dissect the information from, like I say, the other 102 pages. Yeah. I mean, I, I can I can give you any that... Well, no, I don't. Want, it's not a matter of you giving it to us. It's a matter of this board should really have this information. Uh, since we have not approved any of these positions before, we always used to have to approve positions, you know, vote to approve positions, and just by them being in the body of this, if we approve this on the consent agenda, then there's 11 new positions approved. <laughs> I mean, am that, I the only person that has a problem with this? Is that the way we've? Is that the way it's been done before, Christy? Uh, or? Well, in most, in many cases, the positions are brought separately, like at the beginning of the year when we know, you know, like we have to add teaching staff and this, that, and the other. But this year, this because this was the mid-year true up, we did we just referenced the 11 positions on the cover page, and then we attached them on the on the last page as a summary. Just thought that would be a uh, more of a sum, summarized way to do it. Dr. Holland. Uh, 
I think you now the five plus years I've been on here, we've normally listed the positions and shown them to us. I, I, I think Ron is right. I, I believe that would be a better way, a more accurate way for us to look at it than being put at the tail end of a consent agenda. It's just my preference. I would like to see it. I'm not saying they're not needed. They very well may be, but I'd like for us to be able to consider it a little more clearly. Mr. McLennan. Christy, how much are the 11 jobs or the new positions? What does that total up to? Uh, a little over 390,000. <laughs> Say that one more time. A little over 390,000. It's primarily, uh, a lot of it's classified support staff. Uh, it's no different than a growth position when we're going through the course of a year. And so start of the year, you know, mid-year true up, just chewing up the budget and trying to make the shifts appropriate. So, Christy, for the record, can you go through each position and tell us the salaries? Okay. Um, yes. Let me see what order they're in. Uh, the um, first one listed is the... Um, uh, the ELL teacher, and um, and this was, this is for a half a year. That would be thirty thousand oh twenty four. The truancy officer thirty three thousand seven forty one. The ELL content lead teacher slash coach is uh, thirty six thousand nine oh four. The um, Newcomer Center Coordinator, 77,860. That's actually the whole year in, 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 that, in that case. Um, uh, we, we had put the whole year salary in on that one. But the, the, the equity, I'm uh, moving the part-time clerical person in the equity office to full-time <clears throat> would be, um, Let's see, I've got it here, the 16,722. The two behavior teacher coaches, 67,505. IT help desk technician, 26,572. Uh, the nurse, 23,933. Guidance counselor, this is a 120 day contract, so it, it, it may not be in, you know, it's, it's, it's a 120 days, and that would be uh, 28,305. The um, alternative school teacher um, slash admi administrator to oversee the alternative school, that would be um, 30,000. And the in-school suspension monitor, which would be for 120 days, would be 20,013. And that's your um, 390. And then the newcomer center coordinator is for the what we're about to get ready to talk about with the MOU with Howard, correct? No, that's something else? The newcomer center is at Howard. It's at Howard. It, it is at Howard, but it's not that position. That's a different position. Oh, okay. Okay. Dr. Highland. Yeah. These are all new positions. They're being requested, never been funded before, correct? All additions. All additional. Is this oh, the guidance counselor? Is that part of the ones that we added, Dr. Johnson? You know, when we voted to add guidance the, counselors? Uh, 120 day contract. This is the, that, that's the only one that's 120 days, so that's not a. Okay, that's not one that we already on. added. Okay. Yep. okay. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Robinson. Yeah, just to clarify, um, these 11 positions are within this mid year true up, and it's still a balanced budget with the 11. That's right. Okay. We were so very fortunate that. to be able to do this with no increase. Mr. McClendon. So this is mid-year. Are these, these positions haven't been already hired, have they? No, no sir. Oh. Mr. Smith. Uh, Chrissy, the truancy officer, new position, right? So right. Said, you know, so we don't have that person now. Uh, uh, there might be, they might be advertised, but nobody has been hired. Okay, all right. Will, will that person be uh, be working all over the district, or, or just certain parts, or primarily the Howard area? Thank you. Oh, I thought we already had a truancy to two. Do we not already have two truancy officers? Uh, not. I think there's one in the Howard area. One in Brainerd, one in Howard. Oh, there. Yeah, yes. Now there is one in the Brainerd area. This is for the yes. Howard area. So the Brainerd's is Howard's going to have two. No, it's one in Brainerd. 
No, no, they already have one at Brainerd. They already have one at Howard. Am I right? That is correct. Okay, thank you. So this is an additional truancy officer because we already have one. This is a new position. So we're going to have two. This is not hard math. That's that's correct. Okay. You're going to have two for Howard, just for one school? That is correct. Is it for only the school or is it for the area? The area. Like, so, so it's more than just one school? Yeah, no. yeah so it's going to probably be for the school. So let's talk data for a minute. Uh, just now, hold to, on just a minute. She said yes, you said no. Who's right? Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to be right. Uh, it's, okay. It's, I'm <laughs> no, going to be right, Ron. No, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be right. It's, okay. for, it's for Howard. Let me, let me, give, let me give some context. No, so it's we're, for Howard. That's what I need to know. Yes, let's give some context, though. Uh, so one of our accountability metrics as a school system uh, and, and, and I probably need to frame this a level higher. We have to, and this is probably a budget cycle conversation, we've got to address truancy as a school system. Yes. Uh, and that's a separate conversation. Right now our social workers are engaged in truancy work, and uh, and really they need to be doing social work, but we need people to attack truancy as well. So that's a separate conversation. So let me give some data, some hard data. Uh, when you look at Howard or Brainerd, it's going to hurt our school system. It's already hurting the schools, but it's going to hurt our school system. When you look at Howard and Brainerd, you have roughly 50% of the kids that are that are missing 18 days or more, which means they're chronically absent. And and what that does is it one, you got kids that are missing almost a month of instructional time. Uh, but beyond that, as a system, uh, it, it, when we talk about subgroup performance and and what are the things that are that are hard spots for us that we shared with the commission and we shared with our delegation, those areas that are that are tough spots for us as a district that we have to close the gap on. So it is it is a strategy to try to get students in school, uh, to try to get them there every day. And, and we recognize across the system, because I want to be real clear with what the narrative is, across the system, truancy has been a focus. In fact, uh, Karen Glenn and, and that team, uh, we sent a message out. I recorded it myself. We sent it out uh, before school started, uh, encouraging parents to, you know, uh, make sure, hey, we want your child at school because we want them to learn. But we've got to address this across the system, and we need to look at it uh, candidly, probably in conversations around the budget cycle, because we have every learning community has these issues. But what we're trying to do is triage, because we can't address all. We're trying to address it where we see the biggest spikes right now, and then navigate it throughout the way, uh, throughout the district. Like, if you all recall from retreat, I'll give another piece of data. If you all recall from retreat, I shared a document with you that accountability and research had done, and that data pointed to at the ninth absent we could tell that there was what was it, an 80% chance that that student would be chronically absent. And so we have schools that are tracking uh, a, a, a significant proportion of students that are approaching or beyond that ninth absence. And we know they're going to be chronically absent. So we're triaging, uh, trying to put strategies in place to elevate uh, really uh, student performance and make sure that they're in school. And so uh, again, uh, when we look, we know where the the hot spots are, and we can't attack it all right now. We wish, you know, we wish we could do it across the, the district, uh, but we're trying to hit the hot spots as intentionally as we can. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, Christy, you're saying that all of these salaries that you gave are half your salary, so we just need to double it to say what the salary is going to be when these are presented to our budget next year, correct? Yes, right. Okay. Everything <coughs> needs to be doubled except the newcomer center coordinator, you know, or are there, they going to be? There's a couple of half time positions in here, like we mentioned the the um, uh, 120 day yeah, positions. Yeah, I got that. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay, but the, the newcomer center coordinator, whatever that is, uh, that's almost seventy-eight thousand dollars. Is that going to be the full-time salary? Yes. Right. Okay, so that's not a half year. So the rest of these are, and the uh, the rest of them need to be double. Okay. Were all of these paid for? How were these paid for? Okay, so we had savings. So we found, this, okay, go ahead. This, we had savings this year generated from our uh, mid-year true up. So we applied everything toward um, going toward c- continuing on with our strategic plan goals, and this is what. So most of these were the not from were. grant money or anything. Did these come out of our general budget? This, this, this is this will be part of the GP budget. <sighs> The total GP budget. It's it's all, it's everything is balanced in here. It's just these are added now because okay. we had savings. This is how we are spending the savings. Yeah. It's amazing how we find money when we want it, isn't it? It's always amazed me. Um, Three hundred ninety thousand dollars falls out of the sky. Um, 
and next year that will be a whole lot more. I mean, uh, by the time it's over, it'll be, uh, you know, <laughs> three quarters of a million dollars. It's insane. Um, I just have a problem with this is the way that we're going to start approving um, positions. You just added on the end of a 103-page document, oh, well, y'all approved it when you voted for your consent agenda. I have a huge problem with that, and everybody on this board should have a problem with that. Uh, and uh, like I say, I've, I've seen this kind of thing in the past, but it was under prior administrations, and I sure don't like seeing it now. We, we, yeah, the, well, the cover memo references the positions. Uh, I, I'll also add that we had a budget work session in which we talked about it, and 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 we're an open book as far as uh, um, uh, you know any questions that uh, are there. Uh, you know, you you all have hired me as superintendent to try to move your goals and your vision forward, uh, Rhonda, and so uh, that's that's what we're trying to engage in doing uh, and trying to do that in a very intentional way. And so uh, we're not, uh, you'll see with any savings we have, we put it right back to the schools uh, and trying to make sure that we support teachers and leaders on the ground with some of the things that, that they are struggling with. And again, it's it's hot spot areas, you know, uh, that we're trying to, to look at and address, whether it be chronic absenteeism, whether it be behavior, uh, whatever the case may be and so uh, that's well, I guess it just bothers me when I we've had teachers cut up in my end of the district because we didn't have the money and then you see all of a sudden these new things that are just s s for specific areas of the school system and you cut things in some area to be sure to provide for other areas I have a problem with that we we provide it across the system uh, we have provided across across this school system we have um, we have provided and try to do so and so um, again it, it, the conversation is where does the system want to be and I think we're, uh, we're we're moving in a, a good direction academically uh, I point you to that and we'll just um, try to continue that work but um, I, I do want to meet speak to cutting while I have a moment um, you know one of the things that we have to look at as a system is there's uh, there's been uh, some systems processes and structures that have been broken and uh, staffing is one of those things and as we get those things in line there are many more crucial conversations that we'll have to engage in collaboratively uh, to make sure that operationally we're we're functioning uh, in such a way that you can continue to move student achievement forward and so you know uh, Brent and Christy uh, you know we'll we'll continue to dig into our budget uh, and and make sure that we, uh, we we address some areas across our system to to get uh, our systems tighter, uh, the, the systems uh, aren't as, uh, the structures aren't as tight as they should be uh, for a $400 million organization, and that's what we're uh, we're working on right now. Dr. Highland. Uh, thank you, Dr. Johnson. I, we do appreciate uh, fiscal responsibility for sure. I, I would agree with Rhonda that it might be a positive in the future if when we have additional roles that if they could be listed in a separate manner, you know, real clearly, that might make it a little easier, a little more palatable for everyone. I think they're probably needed. Uh, the ELL, two ELL, ELL positions, is that due to uh, added uh, uh, needs in that area? I mean, growth and, and the English language learner community. Yes. Do you want to answer that? Yeah, I do. I do. Uh, Are those system wide or certain skills? All right. So uh, again, where the growth is, I guess. But yeah, it is. So we've grown in the ELL population. Again, I want to give some context. Uh, while I have a moment for the last uh, three years, even before my arrival, uh, the district was operating out of compliance in regards to uh, ELL. Uh, it, it just has been, and has been applying for waivers. Uh, and so uh, we have had to add, and the state basically said we have no more time. And so uh, we have added over the course of the last year and a half 17 ELL teachers to get in compliance with the state because we had not been operating in compliance and underserving students of, of the ELL population. And so uh, we were right sizing in that area. We have to right size in special ed in our school district. Um, we've got to right size in a lot of areas to get ourselves on track. And that's what our work is. And it's uncomfortable uh, in the midst of that, but we're trying to tighten those things, one, to be in compliance but more importantly because it's just the right thing to be doing by children.
Now, that, that was my understanding. Also on the two behavior uh, areas, and I, and I think we need behavior specialists. Is that is that system wide or certain? S system wide. Or, yes. There system -wide. will be system wide to support and learning communities. Yeah. We heard that feedback from mm -hmm. teachers, and we heard that feedback from leaders, and uh, those those are system wide supports. And that was my understanding. I just wanted you to confirm that. Thank you very much. Ms. Lennon. Um, I'd like to thank you for having the agenda review session on January the 10th because we did get to go over all of this um, at that review session. And I we did decide at the review session that we would move it to the Monday before to allow all of us to have more time to look at that agenda review session so that when we have it next month that we will um, be able to ask more questions. So I think it's really um, beneficial for the board to be able to have that time to ask Dr. Johnson the questions that we're asking him about that because it was very helpful for us that night to be able to go over all of this information. Thank you. Mr. McClennan. Just so I can wrap my head around this, so these these 11 jobs, they when this budget cycle ends, this budget ends, next year they will still be on staff. Correct. And so what if we don't have the savings? No. Well, we'll we'll have to vote to put them in the new budget. You have to vote to make them line items. Yeah, they'll have to become new line items in the new budget. Gotcha. That's, that's what I was. All, that's our last front. Mr. Thurman. Gotcha. When you get an agenda. You should not have to look through 103 pages to find a list of all the new positions. I don't care if we have 10 agenda sessions. It is not right. We, this board should not have to play hide and seek to find things. And, you know, I, some of us, they, they, uh, you know, if you don't come to an agenda, and there's no way anybody in, in this board would have found this on this agenda item on Thursday. I'm sorry, there's no way. If anybody did, I want to know who it was. Uh, because there's, like I say, this it's a lot of stuff to look over, and I had to look over it two or three times to find it myself. Uh, so to think that agenda session is going to, no, we should not have to do this. This should not be the way that we run this board. Mr. Smith. Yeah, I agree. I, th I think if it, it maybe had been at the beginning, we saw that, we wouldn't be having this. So I want to trust our superintendent and our staff that's going to uh, lead us in the right direction. So but it'd be helpful. If we wouldn't have to go through all that to, to uh, see these new positions. The other thing I wanted to say that I'm pleased that we're adding another truancy person. <laughs> uh, it's much needed, and we're losing a lot of kids, and and so I'm glad we're doing that. I would encourage those folks, whoever they are, uh, to really work closely with the juvenile court because I hear some frustrations from the juvenile court that that our people, our school people, are not working closely with them. So just a comment. Ms. Mosley Jones. So I, I'll be honest, I saw, well, one, I was at the agenda session briefly when they, we talked about it last week, but I did see it in the initial uh, lineup, um, the initial announcement before we got into this. I'll be honest, I did not go back through to see what the positions were because I did recognize it was a balanced budget. And so I was kind of like, well, the positions are needed. We're not in an overture. So why not? Considering pretty much from looking at the positions, I knew where they were going. And I knew that those areas were in need, drastic need. And they're in need because maybe in some years past, there was no attention there. So, like I said a couple of months ago, we're just going into a period where oftentimes when people were comfortable and others were uncomfortable, the roles have reversed. And it is an uncomfortable conversation, but we are obligated by federal law with ESSA, with state law, and with our own strategic plan, we've obligated ourselves to address these issues. And if we don't address them, even though they might be at two or three schools, it's going to affect Hamilton County Department of Education. Not Brainerd, not Howard, not Tyna, Hickson, East Ridge, Udua, wherever it is. It's not gonna affect that individual school, it's going to affect us as a whole. And we can't do that because going back to what Jeanette said in her in her spiel, excuse me, not spiel, but you get what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. When she was talking about the grading A through F and all of that stuff, if that passes, then guess what? Those schools are F, C, D, and F schools. Then that reflects Hamilton County Department of Education, not Highland Park Community and Howard and East Lake. 
it, 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 we're not going into silos, we become a group that's being affected. So we're either going to do what's right by kids and know maybe we you shouldn't have had to go back through, but I didn't. I admit I didn't. I just was like, go for it. But they'll work on that the next time. I don't think it's fair to just keep rehashing it when we know ultimately the goal was to do what was right by kids. And some of us did actually see that, whether we saw the amount or not. And now that we know the amount, let's just move forward. We can't keep rehashing over what they should have did. I think they pretty much got it. They're all adults. Let's quit scolding them. They're going to move forward and, and do better the next time. Just for the record, I want to be real clear as a preference to the board, and, and this is why we have the agenda sessions prior to, um, as a preference to the board, the board's preference, and we'll make note of it as we go through the next mid-year true up. But we did note in the memo, uh, it says, you will note addition, this is on the cover memo, you will note the addition of 11 FTEs, including two part-time positions in the attached amendment. If that... It, that's that's on the cover memo that's there for the board. So I think if there's a question about that, we we will we'll get even more granular, and it even it, it points you know to look at, but we'll get even more granular to list those out specifically, duly noted, and we'll make sure we we do that next time. Do I have a motion to approve? Move Senate. to approve. Second. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Hollander. Yes. Mrs. Hill. Yes. Mrs. Jones? Yes. Mrs. Lennon? Yes. Mr. McClendon? Yes. Mrs. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mrs. Thurman? No, because of the way it was done. Chairman Wingate? Yes. All right, that moves us to uh, our business matters. Uh, and then we have our uh, recommendation for the Knox County contract for procurement card services. Mr. Goldberg, you got anything you want to say about that? Or Ms. Jordan, either one? Yes, sir. I want to get everybody that's in. Our new um, chief business officer, Brent Goldberg, and he's going to uh, present this item. Thank you, Chairman Wingate. Unfortunately, I thought I was going to follow the Boy Scouts tonight, but <laughs> I got in line behind that behind that discussion. Um, uh, yes, we are recommending the use of a Knox County Cooperative Purchasing Agreement uh, to for procurement card services. Um, we believe this is something we need to do to move forward with our effective and efficient operations by using procurement cards, uh, particularly for small dollar items, which is generally defined as under $2,500. Um, it's the same procurement card system the Hamilton County government uses. Um, the reason we're recommending the Knox contract, however, is because it includes a consortium rebate that allows us to pool our purchases together with Anderson County, Knox County, City of Murfreesboro, Electric Power Board, City of Chattanooga, and any other local governments within the state of Tennessee that, that join this cooperative, and that allows us to get larger rebates over time. So again, it's the uh, same program the county uses. Uh, we're going to use it for, for small dollar purchases. The, we don't have any change to the purchasing rules. It's just simply adding a new mechanism to purchase. Um, so currently we have purchase orders, contracts, and payment vouchers. So this would add purchase cards as, a, as another mechanism. Um, we believe it's a, a highly controlled environment. Uh, we're going to use the procedures that we've adapted from Hamilton County government. and. This will give us a lot more visibility actually into our small dollar purchases, allow us to analyze purchases a little better. It gives us control in a way that we don't currently have with payment vouchers. Um, the systems use payment vouchers for the past 20 years or, or more, probably before merger. But um, those are literally pieces of paper that, that primarily maintenance staff and others have in their vehicles that they use to purchase stuff that they need at you know hardware stores, places like that. So uh, that'll be the first group that we uh, use purchase cards for. And uh, it, like I said, the visibility we get through SunTrust Portal um, lets us see stuff that we can't currently see with payment vouchers in real time. And um, we have procedures in place, and we have alerts in place, so if there's any sort of misuse for the cards, um, we'll just turn the card off. We'll be able to do that anytime remotely, um, whether it's the superintendent or someone on the maintenance staff. I'm not afraid to turn anybody's card off if it needs to be turned <laughs> off. Um, That's good. So uh, this is also a best practice identified by the um, Government Finance Officers Association. Um, 
as an efficient, cost-effective method of purchasing and paying for small dollar as well as high volume transactions. Um, so over time, once we've completed implementation, we plan to house some purchase cards in the purchasing department that can be used to pay for things like utilities or other recurring charges in order to get rebates on things that we already have to spend money on. And those those cards would be controlled by the purchasing agent and uh, have a higher limit than you know the others. The other cards will, will have a $2,500 purchase limit and, and we'll be able to have visibility for when certain vendors get over you know that those thresholds, the threshold of 2,500 to get quotes and the threshold of 25,000 to bid. Dr. Highlander, I think. Okay, I, I think I know at the agenda session we discussed this, and I appreciate this. And the the program really seems good, but let me get it straight on the limit. It's twenty five hundred per individual card. Yes. Yeah, so so there will be a there's going to be a limit of twenty five twenty. It's actually two thousand four hundred ninety nine dollars and ninety nine cents for any one transaction. So no one will be able to buy anything more than that amount. Um, do they have to check with anyone before they spend twenty twenty four hundred ninety nine dollars? No, it was. It's no different than our current purchasing regulations. So if it's in their budget and it's something they need, again, maintenance staff does this on a routine daily basis with payment vouchers. Yeah, I, um, I see. They they buy you know a set of pipes or a wrench or you right. know some nuts or whatever. But I, I just in my mind, it's hard for me to fathom twenty five hundred being being a small purchase. But, well, that uh, that's the that that is the that that's the definition of a small purpose. According to our board policy okay. and our in our procurement procedures, so okay. the reason that limit is set that way is so that um, you know that's the that's where we have to start monitoring to get quotes. Okay, thank you, Mr. Robinson. Um, so you said that there's a way to see what people are purchasing. I guess in real time, is that what it is? Yeah. Um, does the does do the do you have the ability to also block like where people can purchase things from? Yeah. So like. You know, you're not going to let everyone like go spend twenty five hundred dollars at Best Buy. So therefore, right. like some people's cards we blocked at that. Yeah, okay. that's a great question. I missed that point. We are able to block um, categories. We're able to put limits on categories. We're able to lock or unlock travel. So you know, for for like the maintenance staff, for example, which is who we're going to start with, we will close off travel. We will close off uh, food. We will close off. Uh, you know, probably gasoline, you know, all those types of things. We'll work with, yeah. with Justin's department to figure out what they need to be able to purchase. Um, but we can close off full categories, but we can also close off specific merchants. So if there is, you know, someone that we do not want people buying from, we can turn off that specific merchant. merchant. Um, and, yeah, we can go in and look. I mean, it's a, just SunTrust provides a portal that we can go into and, and identify what's happening in real time we can run reports and we can we can do analysis that we act, you know frankly can't do right now uh, with the small dollar stuff that we have until later on we can do it you know historically from an accounting function and it's it's a much more cumbersome process than what we'll have through this portal okay and then um the rebates that you mentioned is that really most more like a like cash back program like what you have with your credit cards is that what you mean by that yeah they we, okay. they will send us checks I got you. For, um okay. and they the rebate percentages range anywhere from one to two percent depending on the total consortium spend and depending on how much uh, our portion of the consortium spend is. There's also separate rebates for large ticket items. So, you know, if uh, that, the reason that's separate is because, you know, they don't want to give you a big rebate if you can put, you know, 20,000, 30,000 on a card, which we do not plan to do, but but those are all separated into different tiers. Okay, I have one more question for you. Um, and I wasn't at the agenda session or I would have asked this then, but I can't, um, I didn't see it in the contract, but is there a price to be a part of the co-op? No. So the, okay. this uh, approval of this contract does not obligate any dollars. It's simply allowing us to use uh, SunTrust for procurement card services, and then there will be cards issued, and we, and then you know the dollars will be spent. Is there the any budget. fee to SunTrust that we're paying? No. No. There, there's a fee schedule in here where they've waived almost all the fees um, as part of the the bid. This was a fully bid contract with the Knox County bid. There were, I think, nine banks that responded. If, if I'd have to go back to to Knox County's bid documents, but um, they waived nearly all the fees. There, there is a fee schedule in here that shows all the fees that were waived, and then other fees that would apply. Okay. Thanks. 
Mrs. Thurman? Yeah, just the, the rebates that, that we uh, will be getting, will that money go into a fund balance? Will it be in a separate account so we can kind of keep up with how much we're getting? Will it go into a general fund? Do we know yet? the money that we get where it will go? It, it'll be general fund. Um, we will set up an account on the general ledger to track how much rebate we've received. Um, th that brings up another point. Um, we are not allowing any federal dollars to be used. You can't purchase anything on the purchase card with federal dollars okay. so or, or other grant dollars because we don't want um, people to go out and purchase things that we may not be able to reimburse later, you know, to get reimbursed from the grant. So everything will be general fund. We'll have an account set up for it, um, and it will, um, you know, wash out in the budget at the end of the year. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Maybe a Justin question. I'm just wondering, do, all these vendors that, that we use, do we ever approach those guys for uh, philanthropic support? Hello? <laughs> that may be a Justin question. Uh, we actually have some volunteer for, for some of that. I mean, uh, I don't know if the vendors off the town. I know there's a couple of architects that actually provide services in the Give me the list. I'll go ask them. <laughs> well, and Mr. Smith, I'll say one thing this does for us. It gives us um, more visibility, like I said, than we've had before. This is kind of a start for us to start building out a better management information system for procurement in general. Um, I would like to start doing a lot more analysis around procurement to determine um, which vendors that we may need to go to to start negotiating discounts, for example, or ask money for philanthropic purposes or um, determine, you know, if it makes more sense to, to do a contract with, um, you know, two or three vendors for certain products so that we can get better pricing. And those are the types of things that the, this will start us in that direction. And this will actually lessen the burden significantly for people to be able to purchase stuff. And, and, and it's not, I mean, people are purchasing stuff right now. It, it takes, you know, hours to be able to go buy something for for fifty dollars when you could could do it instantly and the cost to produce a purchase order is about ninety dollars on average the cost to do a p card transaction is about twenty dollars on average so those are not hard dollar savings but that allows us to shift time and you know man hours to other functions that are, that are in our better interest to use strategically Dr. Highland. It sounds like a really good program. Let me, you know, different vendors are going to have different prices. And will this enable anyone for us to analyze prices? For, for instance, plumbing company A may charge 800 and then plumbing B 6 and but yet yet our plumbers like A, even though it's more expensive. Is there any, would that not help us in analyzing cost analysis? Yes, it will. We, I mean, this will be able, we'll be able to pull information from the SunTrust system to say, you know, we, we noticed that someone's been buying pipe, for example, from these three vendors, and this one cost way more than the other two, but then we have decision make. Are we buying those because it's a much better quality, so we're getting a better value, and we don't have to replace that pipe again in six months? Because um, sometimes the cheaper one's not the better value uh, or the best interest of the school district. So, But that will give us visibility to let us determine, like I said, if we can say, all right, we should start Going, we should go to this vendor and instead of uh, one off. We should negotiate something with them uh, through the bid process. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. We should have put this before the true <laughs> Dr. Highlander. Yes. Mrs. Hill. Yes. Mrs. Jones. Yes. Mrs. Lennon. Yes. Mr. McClendon. Yes. Mrs. Robinson. Yes. Mr. Smith. Yes. Mrs. Thurman. Yes. Chairman Wingate. Yes. All right. Next, we have a request for a grant funded position. Um, who's going to handle that? Dr. Drake. Dr. Drake. Okay. Yes, this is a request for um, a truancy officer at um, three schools, Lakeside, Red Bank Middle, and um, Tommy Brown Academy. We currently have approximately 19 social workers, truancy officers that service uh, 71 of our schools because some of them have one 
in, to, at each individual school. So they are assigned to um, the average of four schools per truancy officer. This will help these schools deal with their um, truancy issues, chronic absentee issues, and this will um, be funded with federal funds. So a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Could I have questions? I'm sorry, go this ahead. This is the way we usually approve positions, just for the record. Dr. Highlander? Yes. Mrs. Hill? Yes. Mrs. Jones? Yes. Mrs. Lennon? Yes. Mr. McClendon? Yes. Mrs. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mrs. Thurman? Yes. Chairman Wingate? Yes. That brings us to board policies. Do I have a motion to approve board policy 2.800? So moved. Second. All right, Ms. Ford. Dr. Highlander? Yes. Mrs. Hill? Yes. Mrs. Jones? Yes. Mrs. Lennon? Yes. Mr. McClendon? Yes. Mrs. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mrs. Thurman? Yes. Chairman Wingate? Yes. Do I have a motion to approve board policy 2.808? So moved. Second. Dr. Highlander? Yes. Mrs. Hill? Yes. Mrs. Jones? Yes. Mrs. Lennon? Yes. Mr. McClendon? Yes. Mrs. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mrs. Thurman? Yes. Chairman Wingate? Yes. Do I have a motion to approve board policy 6.701? Move to approve. Second. Mr. McClendon? Yeah, so going through this, um, on the second page, line 26, says property received through crowdfunding sites is considered to be property of the district and will remain in the classroom if a teacher moves to another site, either within the district or to another school system, the materials re remain in the school. Um, when I was looking over this, I was thinking of all of our teachers that are using donors' shoes and sites like that. Um, and I, I don't know, I think it's been a practice of the district and maybe every other district, but those teachers are taking their time to do that. Um, and I actually called my principals today and they said, yeah, they've heard, you know, teachers are kind of upset, you know, hey, I did this, um, but now I can't take these materials with me. Um, so I, I don't agree with that. And I just, I wasn't there Thursday because I was in Nashville. So I wanted to bring that to the attention of the board. Dr. Highlander. Yeah, I, that's why I didn't immediately approve that. I, I understand what you're saying, and as a former teacher, when we work hard to get something in the classroom, and it's uh, then I, and we're continuing teaching, maybe in another setting, it would be good to be able to utilize the material. Then you, sometimes the new teachers don't even want to utilize those materials, and they're wasted. Ms. Thurman. Uh, yeah, I, I, talk, I mentioned this to Scott earlier. At one time, it must just be a practice because it's not in this policy. We only have, could only have two fundraisers a year. Uh, is that something that we monitor here? Is that something that we still do? Is that? I didn't hear it. Yeah, so. The two, the two fundraiser rules. Uh, That's Tennessee state law that, that okay. has previously been referred to as the Girl Scout cookie law. Yeah. Um, but that that actually does not have there. There's no legal impact of having more than two fundraisers, other than a nonprofit entity could lose their sales tax exemption. Um, I mean that that's my understanding uh, as a CPA. I am not a lawyer, um, so I know like there's some uh, school support organizations, for example, that that is the rule. They cannot have more than two fundraisers if they are a tax exempt entity without risking the loss of their ta tax exemption. Now, does the state you know monitor and enforce this? That's a, a different question, but it doesn't impact us as a school system because we're not um, subject to sales tax. Okay, well, I just know it in the years past. Am I, does anybody else know anything about this two year thing? That, that, I think uh, that refers more to the school support organizations. And, and uh, like in PTAs and stuff. Because the kids are raising money all the time. That's why I'm asking. I mean, it's just gotten to the point of being ridiculous. I, I think it's actually two separate things. And, and, and Sherry's is reminding me that, that it, you're correct that when you're talking about. Um, a not-for-profit doing fundraisers within a window of time, they're restricted by the state. But what, what Ms. Thurman is referring to and, and what, we've, what we recall from the dark recesses of time is that the central office uh, 
finance in particular, was really concerned about a, a, a historical time in Hamilton County Schools when the hands were, were always out. We we're doing lots of fundraisers constantly. And it's also when our school fees were really, really, really high. And so what she's referring to is there was a poli a, an unwritten policy of the central office not approving these fundraisers because no one wanted parents to get beaten to death with the handouts. But to my knowledge, and, this, and Christy, I have to look at you, to my knowledge, that was never reduced to writing. I know it was never reduced to writing and put into board policy. Yeah. I don't know if Christy's office ever had a, an administrative procedure that spoke to that. So, so I think it's like a good judgment rule. The, the state clarified their procedure a couple of years, about maybe three or four years back. And now there is, no, there is no school in our system that has two fundraisers because the state even considers a Coke machine as 12 fundraisers instead of one. And so it does not, it, it does, there are no schools that only have two fundraisers anymore. So, it, and it primarily, what, what, what it, where it helped in the past was it meant you didn't have to pay sales tax. But we pay sales tax on anything that is re, a resale item. So that's the, um, that's the state law, and okay, well, I just I just remember because that, yeah, that I, I just remember that. And another thing that is kind of disturbing to me, and it's not really referenced in here, and I don't know how you handle it, but I talked to Joe earlier about this, is the fact that kids get uh, rewarded for selling things, and they get taken out of class sometime for pizza parties, ice cream parties, all these kind of parties while the other kids have to watch. I'm wondering if that is uh, like a, a fee to, that's such a, that should be a four letter word. Fee should be a four letter word. But anyway, this, uh, yeah, I'm just, I just have a problem with that. Uh, I know that my my husband will write a check. My husband just asked my grandson, "How much money do you need to get a T-shirt?" Well, here, here, this amount, take it, and give it to your teacher. But you know, if, how much do you need to be able to go to the ice cream store? Okay, here. But you know, not everybody will do that. Not everybody can do that. Not everybody has, you know, family in town to do that. It really, it really is is. I think a, a bad thing, and I don't know how we, we have approached that, but that is really a problem for me to see some kids that never get to do anything and always get left out of everything. Well, to the extent you're asking me a question, um, the state attorney general's office says that's a fee. And so that we've been explicitly advised that we can't have, and I don't think that's, I mean, you're right, that did go on. I would be very surprised if that's going on now. Because, well, okay, hypothetically, if it were going on, <laughs> it is. Um, it can't because what you're doing is you're giving a benefit to kids on the basis of some. Uh, you're, you're conditioning it upon a payment, and so if it's going on, the, the, the state school board and, and their policy attorney says explicitly that, that we can't do that. So I mean. Hypothetically, if it were going on, it would need to stop. And, and you're right, Ms. Thurman and Ms. Lennon, it, it's been inconsistent in terms of how it's been applied across the district. What we can do is next Wednesday, we have a principal's meeting on the 30th. It's something that we'll bring up and, and address there to make sure. But you're, you're right. It's something that has been inconsistent across yeah. the district. Because I know that uh, Joe had a similar situation where some kids were not allowed to to go to a, 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 a faculty student basketball game because they didn't pay two dollars to get to go so, so you know we those you know there's some kids that don't ever get to do anything and some people like my grandson you know get to go everywhere and do everything and then some little kids never get to do anything and it just breaks my heart to send them to school and then they have to sit in class by themselves and feel bad so something we need to think about Dr. Highlander. Uh, thank you. I, there are a couple of points. One, I, I hope I'm not going to be chastised. I had a couple of my schools that achieved academics, and I chipped in. The principal and I went in together and got money from the mall to get an ice cream, but it was every child in the school. So I would hope that would be okay. Is that right? <laughs> and uh, we did that at two schools, and the kids paid nothing for it. They just worked academically. The other thing I want to say is I, we've had in the past, and Rhonda will remember this, and those of you who have been in the system, Chris, you probably will, on the Fund for Excellence, we have in the past not allowed any other 
fundraiser prior to or during that. But and now it is happening. It, you know, it, we, we, there are other things that are going on in the schools that are inhibiting that. And we, you know, we fund the, the, that fund for excellence sponsors the superintendent's leadership banquet, which is quite expensive, I guess, isn't it, Dr. Johnson? And at the Trade Center and quite a few and other things that, that are needed. So I don't know if we need to put it written policy or not, but, but we need to follow through on the original intent that this board had, what, 20 years ago, Rhonda, maybe? A long time ago. That, and I think we've changed administrations two or three times since that initial, but I think we need to go back the way it started, that the Fund for Excellence is, stands alone with nothing else competing with it uh, in, in an appropriate amount of time. Ms. Ford probably could tell me you know, what the history of that was, if needed, later, or, or whoever needs to deal with it. But I would like to see it be that. Whether it's in writing or not, we need to follow through on it. Mrs. Robinson. As a um, future ready district, I mean, fundra fundraisers are creating the future sales force, are they not? I'm just kidding. Um, I wanted to go back to, <laughs> my son is the reigning coupon book salesman and he sold all those books. But um, I want to go back to Tucker's. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the, it's the coupon book sell. Everybody does the coupon book sale. It's the it's not it's not a school funder. Oh gosh, yes. Say it one more time. I didn't hear you. Yeah, but funds for excellence provides incentives. Yeah. And the schools. No, they do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he. I don't care who paying for. Yeah. They doing it for fun. Yeah. What's the difference? Yeah. I mean, I just want to put. I mean, the same. He won that Creative Discovery Museum gift card, so. Um, <laughs> but actually, I know, yeah. Oh, he'll, he'll outsell you too, so. Um, I actually wanted to go back to Tucker's point, though, about the um, uh, individual fundraising. I, I think you bring up a really good point, and I hadn't thought about that whenever reading through this, so I, I think that's actually a really important piece of this conversation. Um, well, I can address that, Ms. Robinson. Okay, that would be and I, I know Mr. Yeah. McClendon and Dr. Highlander mentioned the same thing. So, uh, you know, we don't recommend that that be changed. The current board policy says that anything that, that is um, per, received in the school, whether whether it's purchased by the school or through fundraising, like when a teacher does donor shoes, for example, that property stays at that school. Okay. Um, one reason uh, that we need to keep it that way is because we do have – state laws that we have to comply with with equipment tracking so uh, a lot of times you know it could be a, a library so bookshelf and books for a classroom but it could also be a computer it could be ipad it could, you know those types of things that we're required by state law to track as sensitive equipment um, we frankly do not have systems in place to be able to track that stuff moving between schools um, and that's why i'm you know that policy exists currently, yeah. and it has existed for a long, a long time. And you know we don't transfer stuff between schools, and we yeah. haven't done that. Now, as over time, as we build out um, our fixed asset um, process and tracking processes, you know we may be able to get to that in the future. But anything that comes into the school, whether it's into an in individual classroom or you know the, something the principal's purchased, um, stays in that school. And if a, you know, also if a, if a teacher you know, leaves the school system, we don't want them taking that equipment because it's owned by the school system. Uh, so, well, sorry, real quick, sure. just, I mean, do you have examples of teachers that, like, raised money for something that, in theory, they should be, like, do you, do you have a reason to, like, argue against that? I'm, I'm I trying mean, to understand those I, I mean, if a, if a teacher, say a second grade teacher at East Ridge Elementary says, I need 15 financial literacy books for this curriculum or whatever else, um, and she gets it in December, but she transfers schools for the next school year, she has to start all over for that. And she doesn't have them anymore. And that the district did nothing to get those. That is private money. That's me donating. That's Sonic is doing it. Community members that are doing it. And I, I don't know if I, I mean, I don't like telling a teacher, hey, you can go spend three, four hours sharing this on social media. Well, and then, no. sorry, you have to go to a different I, I school. guess you could argue, though, that if she said, like, these are for my these are for my fourth grade class at East Ridge Elementary, and then she leaves and goes to Clifton Hills, well, then that's false advertising that the books aren't for 
East Ridge or for Clifton Hills, I guess. Right. So Sorry, I'm just trying the, to think of all the, angles. No, these yeah. fundraisers also, I mean, have to be approved by the principal. And, okay. you know, teachers should not be out fundraising without approval from the principal. Yeah. Um, and if it involves any students, the superintendent, um, yeah. which is part of the change, you know, that's the change we're, we're recommending is letting principals approve, you know, like donors choose type projects. But those are also, when the teachers put those projects on donors choose, those are projects for Hamlet County Schools, not for that individual teacher. And part of this reason that we want the principals to be able to approve this faster is because we're going to have matching funds from the community foundation that is for Hamlin County School schools donors choose projects so you know when they get on the Hamilton County Schools donors choose campaign page that we're gonna have I mean they're asking for money as Hamilton County Schools not as a teacher and, and donors choose will only ship stuff to a school they will not ship it to a teacher's house they will not ship it to central office you know they will only do it to a school if it, even if a teacher orders it at the end of the school year they, they're sophisticated enough to know what our school calendar is so if someone orders if a teacher orders stuff from donors choose say May 15th, they will actually hold it at Donors Choose until the next school year because they don't want it to sit there during the summer when no one's there. No, I, yeah, I just wanted to kind of know why that was there. Personally, I think it hinders teachers wanting to do yeah. stuff. And, and again, um, that's and in current policy. We and, have not recommended yeah. changing And the that. impetus behind the change, I just want to reiterate what, uh, what Brent was saying, the impetus behind the change was to help teachers. So what, what was happening in the past is because the process had to come up through so many different people, when you have somebody that says I've got matching funds right now it was it was slowing them down from being able to access it so hopefully with this change being able to prove it at the principal level teachers have the opportunity to jump into some of those yeah I no, I get that and and from what I've heard it's great that that we've changed that where it goes to the principals I just have heard that hey if I'm gonna spend time and put these projects together and you know share it on Facebook and Twitter and get people to donate and then at the end of the year the school system can do basically or anytime the school system can do what they want with them I, I have a problem with that because we don't give our teachers enough money as it is so yeah. Dr. Highland uh, let me clarify something here what, what I'm referring to Hypothetically, if a government teacher, which I was and did, went on his or her own time in the summer to a workshop that's sponsored by the federal government and they get workbooks on the Constitution and how, how it works and they get it for an edge and said, where do you want it shipped? I want it shipped to my school. But now if, I, I, if I'm a teacher and I transfer to another school, no one else paid for it. The federal government did. They gave it to me because I went to a workshop. Now, is that is that stay with that school? That the the other thing is individually funds. I, if I buy if I buy a if I buy I have through my years bought quite a few thousands of dollars out of my own pocket, and so if I buy say a projector, uh, I forgot it's not a projector now, but it's the thing you put on the the computer and hook it up and project. And I had to I bought one. And then they, try, you know, and the school wants to keep it. I said, I'm sorry, I paid for that out of my own money. Well, if you pay for it yourself, I mean, it's not a school property, so it's not. Okay, and on our and list. if I go to a workshop on my own time yeah. and I'm not reimbursed with county funds. I don't know what our past practice has been. I, I mean, someone in teaching and learning might be able to, to, to talk about that a little, little more. I don't know if teachers carry workbooks. You may want to you may want to fire not. me because when I changed, I loaded them up and moved. moved them. So, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, if, if, if I may to answer Dr. Highlander's question, if, if in that situation, I don't think that this policy would apply because the, the policy that we've got was developed when we started to see a bunch of GoFundMe efforts around the district. And so, and, and so the policy specifically speaks to online fundraising or donation sites. And, and what's going on there is you're soliciting public donations in the name of the school. And so, and so right, and so in, in your situation, Dr. Highlander, I would think that really a conversation with the principal of, hey, I've got some workbooks shipped. I'd like, yeah, you know, they're, they're mine. I want to share them with the school. And so your situation is very, very different. Here, where a teacher 
has a GoFundMe site and is using the name of the school, the principal gets some say because because it's it's that brand. Looping back, if I made something I said earlier, because uh, Ms. Ms. Robinson mentioned her son, who is a stellar salesman, good for him. Uh, anything that the community foundation may donate to a child. Uh, as sort of an incentive, that is separate from the fee piece that, that Ms. Ms. Thurman and I are talking about. So if you've got a pizza party during the regular school day for the kids who, who do super awesome and, and meet a certain mark and everyone else gets to watch them, that's where the, where the State Board of Education's fee policy says, no, you can't do it. But if, if the community foundation says, no, 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 there's an incentive, as long as it's not the kid eating a pizza in front of everybody else, we're fine. The, that gift card of the lot to a books a million, is there still a books a million? Uh, whatever. <laughs> when in Hickson, yeah, so so that's fine. Um, it's, it's, it's the special thing for the class during the regular school day that, that we run afoul of. I'd like to call for the vote, please. So moved. Dr. Highlander? Yes. Mrs. Neal? Yes. Mrs. Jones? Yes. Mrs. Lennon? Yes. Mr. McClendon? No. Mrs. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mrs. Thurman? Yes. Chairman Wingate? Yes. Dr. Bradshaw, the agreement between the City of Chattanooga and Hamilton County Schools? Yes. We would like to temporarily move the Howard Transition Academy to the Southside Rec Center to make room for the ELL Newcomers Program at Howard High School. Once Howard Middle School is completed, the Newcomers Program will move to Howard Middle School and the Transition Academy will return back to Howard High School. Um, uh, so, yes ma'am? Sorry, can I ask questions? Sure. Sorry. That's um, a little shocking to hear that they will move to the middle school. I, maybe because I just wasn't aware of that, but in all the middle school conversations we've had, especially with parents, it's been that the high schoolers and the middle schoolers are going to be separate. So is this newcomer school going to be majority high schoolers? So there's an end of the middle school building being renovated that's closest to the high school. So the plan was to have a couple rooms there for the newcomers. So it's sort of a the end of a, of a wing, wing, so right. there would be some separation mm -hmm. from middle school to high school. I don't, I don't anything in the problem with that. Dr. Holland. So I was going to make the motion. Oh, I'm sorry. Any more, any more questions? Oh, that usually comes after the motion. The second. Oh, sorry. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. No problem. Do we have a motion to approve? So moved. I move. You second. Second. Ms. Ford. No more discussion. Mm -hmm. Okay, Dr. Highlander. Yes. Mrs. Field. Yes. Mrs. Jones. Yes. Mrs. Lennon. Yes. Mr. McClendon. Yes. Mrs. Robinson. Yes. Mr. Smith. Yes. Mrs. Thurman. Yes. Chairman Wingate. Yes. Uh, Mr. Witt, the East Hamilton Middle School project. Thank you, uh, Chairman Wingate. You have there before you the uh, approval recommendation or for approval for the new East Hamilton Middle School. Uh, we're recommending the low bid, uh, apparently bid from Tricon Construction. And uh, for a sidebar, this is going to be on the February 6th commission meeting. I have a motion to approve. So moved. Second. In question. Go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Ms. Thurman. Uh, price tag on this. Uh, Has this increased from what we were initially? To what now? Uh, was this an increase from what we initially we had budget, uh, estimated? We had $45 million in the total project. It's 42 something. It's 40, well, it's, it's 42, 42 It's a little under what we budgeted. But I didn't think it was. <laughs> Mr. McLennan. I had the same question because I wasn't on the board um, when all this went through and I just through looking at past news articles and stuff like that the price tag I came up with was 3635 so I didn't know if that's if we budgeted the 40 it was 45 we that we had several different revisions to, to that um, building package but our, uh, for the, the last bond fund that was approved we had 45 million 45 on it. allocated okay. just okay that's fine I, just higher than I 
Dr. Holland. Uh, this is on behalf of my constituents. Evidently, this, uh, the fact this was coming out for the commission and us came out in the news, and several of my people were saying, uh, is Harrison forthcoming? It's forthcoming. Uh, this one, um, so Snow Hill, we did first. Right. Um, it, we're looking at 2019 opening, East Hamilton, um, 2000, 2020, 2020 right. Harrison, 2020. This is obviously a larger project, a lot tougher site, um, um, athletic field. Fields, a lot, a lot bigger scope. Yeah, so I, I, I'm not asking you justify. I, yeah, I, that, I understand that's the that. Reasoning. Yeah, I understand that. I yeah. just, you know, the some of the folks in the Harris community said, "Hey, are, are we being left out?" And I said, "No, no, no, no. Same 2020 start date as East Hamilton Middle High. That's They've just got more to do in theirs." And correct. I'm correct in that. Correct. That's okay. correct. Thank you very much. Just but does this this includes all the ball fields? This includes everything. Am I correct this that's time? Right. <laughs> <laughs> everything. <laughs> No, no, no porta toilet. Well, I, I, that goes back. Yeah, that goes back to uh, a resolution by the county commission that uh, they were not going to fund any more any more schools that were not complete. Correct. Right. Yeah. All right. Th any more questions? Discussion? Ms. Ford? Dr. Highlander? Yes. Mrs. Hill? Yes. Mrs. Jones? Yes. Mrs. Lennon? Yes. Mr. McClendon? Yes. Mrs. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mrs. Thurman? Yes. Chairman Wingate? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Witt. Thank you. Um, I've got a question here. Um, Mr. Bennett, uh, for item 11, uh, board legislative priorities, um, obviously we've drafted a document. Uh, my understanding was that we were going to vote on that document tonight, but it has not been indicated by the agenda that that is a voting item. So how should we proceed? Can we ratify that draft sure. uh, to be able to uh, present and then do we officially Vote on that later. How do you? What's the best way to proceed on that? So state law says that any time you notice a meeting, you, you it, it's a general meeting, you can take any business that you can lawfully uh, conduct, no matter wh whether you notice it as a voting item or, or not. Uh, you could amend the agenda to add anything, uh, except for for doing anything with the director's contract. So if it's the pleasure of the board to uh, to vote on on this item then you certainly may vote on it all it takes is a motion to approve okay do we have a motion to approve the legislative priorities document so moved second all right discussion Ms. Thurman yes well I will not be voting for this because um, even though you know most of it I agree with but the school vouchers uh, I am not totally against school vouchers. Um, I don't like holding people's kids hostage and saying you have to stay in this school that's been failing for 30 years because we won't give them a way out because it is the parents, tax, it is the parents' money to educate their children. So um, I know that Senator Gardenhire is the one who has carried this bill, I think, for years, and I have talked to him about this. And I have read, as a matter of fact, they haven't, they haven't even uh, adopted the new. Uh, uh, bill, I think that he's that they're going to present for this. Uh, so I really don't even know what it says. So I can't say I'm against it because I don't know what all is going to be in it. But I think he's pretty much covered. I think uh, uh, the accountability uh, uh, piece was one that w was mentioned in here, and I think that it's covered in that bill, from what I understand after talking to Senator Gardenhire about this the other day. So that's why I will be a, a no vote on this, is because I'm not totally against vouchers. I don't. I don't like telling parents that they can't educate their children where they want to with their own money. Any other questions or discussion? Okay, Ms. Ford. Dr. Highlander. Yes. Mrs. Hill. Yes. Mrs. Jones. Yes. Mrs. Lennon. Yes. Mr. McClendon. Yes. Mrs. Robinson. Yes. Mr. Smith. Yes. Mrs. Thurman. No. Chairman Wingate. Yes. All right, do we have any uh, events or announcements not listed here? February board meeting. Yes, uh, I have something. Whatever I did with it and all this. Stuff. The uh, Navy Band 
It's going to be at Soddy Daisy High School on February the 22nd. They would like to have a crowd there. You, uh, you have to have a ticket. You can get the ticket online through Soddy Daisy High School Band website. Um, I think it would be a great thing for all the bands to go to, and I think it would be a, a, it's just a big honor for them to be at Soddy Daisy High School on February the 22nd. It is on a Friday night, 7 o'clock. They suggest you get there by 6.30 at the latest uh, to be able to get a seat, but uh, put that on your agenda. I think it'll it's be a superb great time. band. I've heard them before. They, it'll be well worth going to. Ms. Mosley Jones? Just a reminder for those um, who may be interested, the Brainerd Tyner game that was canceled back in December has been rescheduled for this Saturday, January the 19th at Brainerd High School at 1 p.m. It's always a great game. Um, they're, they're really big rivals, and it's always a great game. It's at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, so do not show up at the school at 6 because no one will be there. So I have to remind people about that. <laughs> Ms. Robinson? Um, I don't know if Justin Witt is still here, Um I think that we are having the groundbreaking for the Howard Stadium on January 30th. As of, that was as of today. I think we're confirming that, but tentatively mark your calendars. You know the time? Ms. Ford, if you, if you hear word on that, could you send notification to everybody, the groundbreaking for Howard? January middle? 30th. Um, I'll loop you into an email with Justin, and we can get that out. Thank you. Dr. Highlander? I, I'll double check with Dr. Johnson. Are we still having that meeting, community meeting, on uh, the 31st at Snow Hill? I, I, think, I think I sent you a message. Uh, Mr. I is um, the same night as parent-teacher conferences, so we were trying to go back and forth and look at some alternates, okay. so we will to be announced. Okay. We will be having – Dr. Johnson and I will be working with the principal at Snow Hill to have a rezoning meeting for that community in the very near future, probably before the next board meeting. Right, Dr. Johnson? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Mrs. Lennon. Um, I don't know what – how the uh, committees are panning out for um, – after Ms. Ford sent out the – Ford. 2019, Mr. Wingate, but we do need to have a policy review committee um, for both January and February. Um, so I will ask Ms. Ford to maybe send out to find out uh, Nakia when we want to do that. And we'll combine. We did cover three of the January policies, but the January policies are fiscal management and the February are personnel. So we will get on that immediately, and I promise I will not drop the ball on it and we'll um, review both of January and February. Thank you. Ms. Robinson? Do we have um, uh, our budget sessions uh, on the calendar yet? Do we? We do. She did? Okay. I apologize. I missed that. Who, who sent it, Sherry? Oh, okay. Cool. All right. I'll right. check. Mrs. Email. Ford, just uh, quickly, uh, February February board meeting is not here, so 21st. So Ms. Thurman will have a chance to remind everybody again about the, the band. Yeah. All right. Anything else? We have a distinguished uh, guest. Yes, we do have a distinguished guest. Commissioner Jeter, thank you for being here tonight. Here, Welcome here. to – yeah. <laughs> we broke you in right. All right, meeting adjourned. Oh, you're, you're, you got good.